Angel Donovan here with another episode of Dating Skills Podcast. We're at episode 70. What is masculinity today? What is being a man and how does this impact your life, your dating, your sex, your relationships? We hear that women like masculine men, but this is rarely described in any practical or actionable detail. And really, most of what we hear is what the media likes to think or portray about masculinity. Mostly it's about the look, and mostly, if we think about it, it's driven by the blockbuster movies and modern heroes portrayed in them. So it's kind of like, by default, we take the ideas from movie screenwriters, from stories, which are set to inspire, rather than finding any true practical philosophy or rules of what defines masculinity that we can live with in this modern world, the real world, which is obviously very different from the films we watch. I think the topic of masculinity is confused today, and it relates to what we call inner game and confidence here at Dating Skills Review. It's an essential part of our self-esteem and who we become. It defines how we relate and interact with women. So it's really important to get this right. And we have someone on the show today who has some great ideas about getting this right. Today's guest is Jack Donovan. He is the author of the book, The Way of Men. This was published in 2012, and it contains very different views from the mainstream. Jack is a very direct and authentic guy with strong and original opinions. And while I may not agree with everything in his mindsets and ideas he covers in the book and in his teachings, he does have a lot of very, very valuable insights into how to be a man today, how that relates to our past and where we've come from, and how we can use this to make better decisions in our life today and to improve our relationships with both men and women. His book, The Way of Men, is a great read, by the way, and highly recommended. Check out my review of it on Dating Skills Review for my complete thoughts. And while I'd put it down as more of an advanced read on the subject, so if you're just starting out with dating advice, it's probably not for you just yet. But it's really a book I'd definitely pick up once you get comfortable with the basic principles, because it's going to open your eyes to some different ways of looking at things. So as usual, to get the show notes and the MP3 download and the interview transcript for the show, you can go to datingskillsreview.com forward slash DSR70. That's DSR70. Now, today I've got also a quick but big announcement. If you've been listening to the show for a while, you'll know I and my team have been working on something new for a long time now. It started with an idea five years ago, and we got down to actually start building it around one year ago. It took a while. We call it the Academy, or Dating Skills Academy. Well, it's finally done. It's taken a lot of blood and sweat, but we're taking in 50 people on the program on the 4th of October, and that's around one week after this episode goes live. In a few words, it's my best attempt to bring two things I saw as lacking to you that we have been struggling to deliver to you because it's not out there anywhere and we didn't have it, obviously, either. So the first one is personal one-on-one mentoring and support that isn't so expensive that it's beyond everyone's reach because the reality is a lot of people can't afford the $10,000, the the $2,500 or whatever dollar mentoring and boot camp programs and so on but they need ongoing support not just like two days but ongoing support so it's a way of delivering that economically the second one is the complete stack of knowledge that i've accumulated on how to get good at this really fast i'm all about learning fast how people learn is what i've seen makes all the difference in getting the dating sex and relationships lifestyle you want So I basically built a system that forces you to learn fast and get results fast. That's all I'm going to say about it. If you're interested, you need to sign up your email to a Dating Skills Academy newsletter. I don't like sending people information they don't want. So that's the only way to find out more and get access to the program when it launches. So you can sign up for it at datingskillsreview.com forward slash academy. That's forward slash A-C-A-D-E-M-Y. I'm Angel Donovan, and this is the Dating Skills Podcast. This is a 14-year ongoing mission to discover the truth about what works in dating, sex, and relationships. To become a better man. Join me as I leave no stone unturned. 
chase down every expert, role model, and mentor with insights to get us to that goal as fast as possible. This show is about bringing you the best of that information so that you can take it in and change your life for the better, step by step, episode by episode. Hey, Jack, thanks very much for making your time to be on the show. It's great to have you on here. Uh, Great to be on. Excellent. So you've become renowned for your work, which is a little bit different from everybody else's on where masculinity is headed today, where the state of men is today. So it'd be great to get a start view into where you're coming from as where is the state of masculinity today, according to you? And how's it developing? What are your main arguments about that? Well, I just think the general like masculinity is failing. It's we're on a downtrend. It's kind of dysgenic. As I wrote in The Way of Men, civilization and masculinity have always been at odds with each other. And it's not just a new thing. It's an old problem. That's why during peacetime, they invented sports. So men would have something to do. They've played games like that all throughout history. And uh, we're coming to a place where there's more and more and more rules and less and less and less risk. And uh, you can't have masculinity without risk because you can't have courage without risk. So I think that as we become more and more civilized, I think men are really kind of in a crisis. And it's not the crisis that other people are talking about, but it's the uh, crisis of not being able to be what we've evolved to be and not really having a role in this society. You don't need to be very masculine to be a consumer. And that's kind of what our society is uh, based around. It's just pure consumerism. Why do you think we need masculinity? What are the negative impacts of not being masculine, like the major things that stick out for you? Embarrassment and shame? I mean, it sounds like a really controversial <laughs> question, but the deal is, I guess, what I want people to understand is why is it such a negative thing that we're, we're losing this or that we don't have as much of this as we used to? Well, when I look at it, it's not so much... We're losing all these characteristics that I think really made us more amazing. If you look at what our ancestors could do and what they endured compared to what modern men get cranky if they don't have, you know, I'm sitting here drinking my rock star so I can wake up in the morning and uh, <laughs> get, yeah, like. <laughs> Is that true? Did you get your rock star this morning? I did. I went to the 7-Eleven and got my rock star. Okay. I'm going to tell you something even more ridiculous. I have nine interviews and other meetings lined up today, but, and I'm jet lagged from traveling across the world. And at seven o'clock in the morning before my first one, I called up a taxi to take me to a 24 hour coffee shop to get a coffee and bring me back. It's the most expensive coffee I've ever had. But I was like, I think I need one to get through today. (laughs) 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 And the taxi driver is like, this is the first time I've ever done this because he took me there and back. Uh, This is what kind of we're reduced to in my life. Grandfather would have been slaughtering a pig this morning, you know, uh, (laughs) you know. In many cases, it's not a question of how it harms us, although men do, as their testosterone goes down, they tend to be more depressed, they tend to be crankier. We are kind of designed to be a different thing than we're allowed to be right now. If you look at what entertainment and what a culture really is today, I mean, is it really better that we're less masculine? If you look at what the, I can't even watch TV or like watch the news or anything like that anymore because it's just basically a bunch of people gossiping. It's about celebrities, celebrities and each other. Uh, constantly, you know, they're arguing about what somebody should have done. I mean, it's basically like this. Every conversation we have is basically like what women used to talk about while the men were hunting. That's our entire national dialogue right now. And it's sad and and ridiculous. And that's what I think our society is kind of without the struggle of masculinity and masculinity requires struggle. We're kind of reduced to sitting around gossiping and reality TV and and so forth. It sounds like it's similar to distraction and not taking action. When you're talking about it there, I was just like, well, it's just distracting us away from getting anything done. So you associate masculinity with getting things done, making things happen. Well, yeah, absolutely. It's, It's an active principle. So you could say that if you're not being masculine, you're not contributing to the world. You're not driving. Well, you can contribute a lot to the world by sitting at your computer and, and doing stuff. I mean, I'm not saying that, uh, there are lots of people who aren't very masculine at all who, invent things and do fantastic things in in different ways. Maybe some of them are good and some of them are bad. Maybe we don't need the next iPhone. But uh, the people who engineered it probably were not, you know, taking breaks to go chop wood, you know? (laughs) I mean, there's a lot of things that you can do in the world that don't require you to be extremely masculine. And you are contributing to society in some way. But I just think masculinity is kind of a higher state of being for men. And I think some feminists have even talked about this. Uh, men are tend to be almost insecure because we haven't been tested. That's the old fight club thing. Like, how do you much do you know about yourself if you've never been in a fight? It makes men, I think, a little nervous and bitchy. 
<laughs> <laughs> and uh, just less confident, which there's no need to debate about confidence being a good thing. So what do you think are the biggest things that are confusing our masculinity today? Some of the things, you know, as I was reading your book, uh, you're, you're talking about some uh, hierarchies and, and the goals, which are the structures that I use today. Things like chasing wealth and all the organizations set up around that, capitalism and so on. Are these things that are confusing our masculinity today because they're giving us different values, different things to chase? Well, yeah, primal masculinity or ancestors that we evolved for for millions of years, is, you know, I mean, that has to do with different skills than what are needed in the world today. And in many ways, uh, women are just as well or probably more evolved to what, uh, say, a modern corporation would want from us in terms of uh, all getting together and feeling good about working on a project and working, consuming and, and so forth. And women can do that just as well as men. I think some of the messages that are confusing everybody from the UN to uh, mainstream magazines, pretty much everyone's saying masculinity is bad, masculinity is bad, masculinity is bad. You should be more like women. I mean, there's many, many, many articles like that that I often see is uh, we need to reimagine masculinity, which always means make it more like women. That men should behave more like women. And uh, we're getting that message constantly. So young men are hearing that. Yeah, which specific values are you talking about when we, we should be more like women? What kind of values are being proposed that we take on or activities? Well, modern corporate existence, you know, wants you to kind of be very highly communicative, willing to be passive and work from kind of a passive aggressive standpoint because women are really good at negotiating etiquette. Mm -hmm. Being highly communicative in that way, willing to be passive for long periods of time is very helpful. I mean, that's why they say uh, young girls do better than boys in school. It's like sit, do exactly as you're told for a very long period of time. Women have always had to be better at that because we would hit them if they, they were. Whereas men have had to have go out and do things. I think that's, you know, see young boys looking out at the window where they, they want to be outside Grown men are the same way to a certain extent. They'd rather be running around and doing something. I know people who had advanced degrees and started driving trucks because they couldn't just sit in a room all day. I think those are the values that uh, are highlighted, a lot of uh, negotiating etiquette and, and that sort of thing that uh, women are very, very good at. And a lot of feeling the same, getting in groups together and feeling the same, a lot of cheerleading. And I think that modern men just tend to be skeptical of that, like, just, just tell me what to do. I worked in different uh, companies for a long time, and it was always about, uh, let's get together and talk about how excited we are about this new project. And it's a lot of bullshit. And a lot of men would just be like, what do I have to work on? Just give me my job. I don't need the uh, mixer. I don't need the after work birthday parties and stuff like that. And women are very, very enjoy that kind of stuff, I think, a lot more. Right. I think you're referring in part to a lot of the change management programs and the cultural, there's a lot of work in organizational behavior and change management and cultural development of organizations. And that's been a great emphasis over the last uh, 15 years. It's been a huge part of that. So I guess in part you're working towards that. So you mentioned consumerism. So is chasing material gains like gathering possessions, is that one of the things that's confusing or distracting us from masculinity today? The whole consumerism? I think that uh, sex and money are really the only outlets, the only ways that men have to be masculine. Uh -huh. They're the only ways to find a dominant position. And I think that that's really unfortunate is that most men, I think, uh, if you measure masculinity by sex and how many women you have sex with, you're letting women define masculinity for you. The same way with money, the uh, skills that you need to acquire money are not necessarily the same. They don't always overlap with masculinity. There is some aggressiveness and so forth. I mean, they always say that the stockbrokers and, and Wall Street are very high testosterone and a lot of them are taking steroids and stuff like that because it's good for their particular job. Right. But that's one job where you can acquire wealth. It's not the only job. Right, right, right. But as far as there are opportunities for that, but I do think they are decreasing. Now, I mean, I don't want to say that the masculinity and wealth are never accumulating wealth and never cross over. I mean, that's actually kind of what the Vikings did was uh, run around and take things from people. I can't say that that's not masculine, but I think the focus on wealth alone leads to distortion because a lot of people can be wealthy in a variety of ways. And so if you're going to make masculinity, if you're going to measure it by wealth, I've often said that Britney Spears is more masculine than most of us will ever be. If that's what you're going to measure it by, there's a lot of ways to get rich in modern society that have nothing to do with being a man. Right, right, right. And Lady Gaga. Yes. She's pretty impressive on that. Justin Bieber. Right. Oh, yeah. Please. No, yeah. please. <laughs> okay. Another thing that we see a lot is men have to develop a purpose. And I guess this is self-development in general. There's a lot of material about developing your purpose. 
But also from if you go into the kind of the business and entrepreneurial areas, they say if you find your purpose, you're going to develop wealth. So there's anyway, there's a lot of talk about it's important for you to define what your purpose is, kind of in the way like Steve Jobs decided what his greatest love in life was, and he pursued that. What do you think of that? Is that a distraction or is that part of something that can bring us closer to our masculinity? That's kind of the individualized version of masculinity. Americans have this very Western notion that was kind of bolstered by the cowboy mentality of uh, everybody out. Clint Eastwood character that's all alone, riding through the desert, seeking his fortune and doing whatever he wanted to. Historically, I mean, masculinity is really about men in groups. And that was kind of the main theme of my book. So finding our individual purpose may be a way to build wealth and so forth and become successful in a career. I mean, obviously, that's what I've done uh, to a certain degree. I mean, I, I certainly have found my purpose. But uh, I think we need something beyond that. I think that masculinity can really only be developed in groups of men because it's really easy to measure your masculinity by your fantasy of yourself in your own head. And I think a lot of men do that. And you can see it when they're arguing with each other on the internet. In their own mind, they're all Conan the King. But uh, if you got them in a room together, I think they'd figure out which one was really Conan the King really quickly. I think that men uh, judge each other. And it's really tempting for men to avoid the judgment of other men in terms of masculinity because it's scary. And uh, you have to deal with the possibility that you're not going to be on the top of the pile. I think that masculinity and that real confidence, I mean, confidence comes from being tested. And if you aren't tested, if you're by yourself all the time, you can kind of live in that fantasy world where you're not being tested. And, and if you have to deal with men constantly, you become more confident from having to deal with that trial. Create a history of success. And that's what confidence really comes from. One of the interesting conflicts with, with today is that independence and individuality is often emphasized, as you said, in the West and especially the U.S., Obviously, your book emphasizes a lot groups of men, tribes, hierarchy within those groups. It's interesting you give your own example where reading your book, you're standing apart from everything else, right, that I've read on the subject. For me, you've taken this new line. You looked at everything out there and you said, no, nah, that's, not, that's not the way I'm looking at it. I'm going to take a, a new line. So you've separated yourself from all the other tribes. <laughs> and this is when I was reading it, I was just like, it's interesting. And you have to do that in order to push things forward. You're going to push human civilization forward, which is a leadership aspect. But you have to be an individual, whereas a lot of your book argues that you have to be also part of a tribe. So how do you marry those? A lot of us are told, like, we should also express ourselves. And this comes back to the purpose as well. If you're being yourself, if you're following your true values, you're going to be more confident. You're going to be tested in some ways. And potentially you'll have a tribe and a following. But it is also this... I'm going to go out on my own and I'm going to be tested and maybe people will follow me if I've got something valuable to say. So I was just wondering how you look at that whole area. It's like separating yourself from tribes. Is that something that you can do at a certain point and not everyone should do it? Because it seemed like the argument is mostly that you should really be within some kind of tribe, within identify with some kinds of tribes or groups of men at first. And, and maybe once you become more competent and you know where you are, you could try and start your own tribe. Is that the way you're looking at it with from this individuality perspective? What I'm trying to do is for guys read a lot about this different stuff where you should be an individual and independent and it's good to create new stuff. We're told this all the time versus your view where you should be a group of men. Is there a way to marry that? And does it make sense from your perspective, from your own path and how you've done that? Well, my path was very kind of an individualistic path that uh, is going the opposite direction and towards leading to a group. I could always be doing my own thing, but uh, I think that uh, the thing about being individuals in the modern world is that uh, individuals are very easy to control. Individuals are very vulnerable and easy to be uh, manipulated by governments because they're very dependent, because they have no external support structure, really. And I think that uh, that makes it very convenient for people who are gaining more and more power in the world right now by having those kind of tribal networks where we, we uh, don't depend so much on the state or governments or corporations and we depend more on each other, I think uh, we can weather the future a little bit better. But in terms of just basic success, I think that you can also still be, you can be an individual within a group. If it's done properly, <laughs> you can do both. I, I do think it's possible. Right, right. Can we take an example from you? How do you see yourself within, within groups of men versus your own individual positioning? Well, I have my own individual message, and then I have uh, different groups of men. I work in my office. This is actually a tattoo shop at a powerlifting gym. I interact with those guys all the time, and obviously uh, one of my best friends there is uh, one of the strongest men in the world. 
he and I in the room together. I'm not the alpha. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I have a very specific message and I have my own thing and he respects me. Then we have a great relationship because he respects what I do and uh, I contributes to what he does. And we kind of cross pollinate that a little bit sometimes. It's great. So I bring something to the table. So I think that you're really not a valuable member of the group if you can't bring something to the table. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be in charge. But having a worthwhile group is surrounding yourself with people, surrounding yourself with men who are all bring something to the table. We have this kind of negative perception of groups as being solely about groupthink and uh, about a bunch of minions and one leader. And I think that that's a pretty crappy group. If you think about our evolutionary history and tribal groups and so forth, they didn't survive by having one guy who was really good and everybody else being kind of a loser. You want the best people for your team, the same way you would pick the members for a sports team. And if you have a bunch of guys that are really achieving in their own way, they're all going to feed into each other and help each other out. And uh, you're going to rise together. Right, right, right. And well, I think what's interesting you bring up there, and it's kind of illustrated the point and the, the challenge I was seeing was that you're with this guy who's obviously, you know, you know his main area is strength, right? And um, yours is kind of a common value. But also you've got this whole unique thing to you and there's variety and diversity there. You guys aren't the same, but you relate to each other and respect each other. So it doesn't necessarily have to be you're all based around the same goal. It's not about the men in your group are all focused on the same goal. It's just that you respect each other for different reasons. Yeah, absolutely. Everybody has different skills. The groups that I watch, power lifters picking on runners and stuff like that. And in a real uh, tribe, you need a scout. <laughs> you need someone to go out and someone who can move fast and someone who can lift heavy things and to use a terrible word diversity uh of skills in there so so you can also do it in this kind of open-minded fashion you were saying it's more like a i don't know a crossfit <laughs> approach like uh, the strength guys can respect the running and the endurance athletes as well which uh, just because they're good at what they do versus you see in men groups versus other groups they're kind of looking down on anyone who's outside of their little group All right which is very natural do you think that's a distraction like or in that something in itself is could potentially be like, you know, modern masculinity is being able to see the value in different approaches to and different skill sets and so on, rather than having to look down on other groups because they're just different. They've got different goals. Well, that's the nature of men. I don't think that's going to go away. And that's one of those things like we can't just get away from that. That's kind of the joke of a lot of modern thinking like, oh, well, we have to evolve past that. Well, that's not really how evolution works. Uh, you know, it's, uh, I think that's hardwired for group thinking and to link up with a group and then to kind of dehumanize the enemy, whether it's this kind of lifter making fun of that kind of lifter or tech guys making fun of strength guys or all kinds of stuff. I mean, it, it happens everywhere. I don't think that's going away. I, I just think that maybe we're picking the wrong kind of tribes. If your tribe is just based around your hobby rather than a, a group of people that you're really closely connected with. I think it's more important to build uh, strong connections with people who have maybe a similar philosophy of life rather than a connection of merely our hobby versus your hobby or our giant corporate uh, sports team versus your giant corporate sports team. You know, <laughs> you know, like yeah. as you say in your book, these are kind of artificially created. I can't remember the exact term used. It wasn't artificially created, but it was something similar. And I think if you look at, for instance, the diet world and the fitness world, you really see that a lot. It's like my way of weight training is, is better than your way of weight training. And people are really, really vehemently, you know, against each other. If you look at like the diets, like the paleo versus, I don't know. It's crazy. People are religious about these things. People are really mean to each other about that. I mean, I've talked about this with a bunch of people. People are really mean to each other about fitness, which is kind of bizarre. But it has to do, I think, uh, with their connection to that because you go to your job or whatever. You do whatever you do during the day. And then for a lot of people, if they actually do work out, that is actually a huge part of their private life. Right. They're invested in it. Maybe you're doing it six, eight hours a week. So that's a huge part of actually your private life. So that becomes your identity. Their fitness program really becomes their identity, which is not the best kind of uh, identity to have. So they end up, again, fighting, uh, tribally fighting for their identity. And, uh, and also in the fitness world, there's a lot of people obviously selling things. So they become like these gurus who say that everything else is bad, but for nineteen ninety nine, you can have my product, which is way better. Right. And they're just contributing to their dynamic by saying everything else is bad. Yeah. Well, they're kind of like the little cult leaders. They become like the cult leaders and then everybody repeat, everybody who bought into their program repeats what they said. There are a lot of cool people. I mean, obviously, I've talked a lot to, to John Durant in the paleo circles and the author of the Paleo Manifesto. And he's very realistic about not being 
crazy and religious about it. But uh, there are other people who are just kind of kind of out to get there in 1999. You know? Right, right. <laughs> so. so the important takeaways from this, is, as you say, men have this natural approach to male groups and everything where they have to set some kind of perimeter because you can't get to know too many people basically you know there's 150 people limit or smaller that you can actually relate to and be close to so after that you have to define everyone else's other and you tend to make those into enemies because it's easier to that's one of the basis of how this is working today is that a good explanation of your... Yeah, yeah I mean and, and the 150 in case uh, listeners are wondering it it's, uh, comes from Dunbar's number that's something that people can look up as to far as how much we can process, how many people we can really care about. And uh, I think it's really, we're told not to think that way. If you sit and imagine, like try and imagine two people, try and imagine 10 people, then imagine 50, then try and imagine 2,000. You can kind of imagine 2,000 people and then you can kind of see a football stadium, but it's actually outside of your range of sight. You have to spin in 360s to get it all or like see it from space. <laughs> and beyond that, we can't really imagine a group of people even close to the amount of people that we're supposed to care about. I think it's just beyond us as humans. You, you, you end up picking and choosing by who the media tells us we care about. Like, oh, this particular group of people got killed today, so we're supposed to care about them, whereas people died everywhere. <laughs> but uh, whatever people focus, whatever the best story is, we pick that to care about. But And it's all very artificial. I'd rather, I think it's more important. And I'm trying to do that in my life. So I, I tend to care a lot less about the news today. I try to focus on just people I actually care about. Right, right. So I think this is the important distinction here is to realize that we have this natural tendency to do, we have a limitation on our brains, how much we can cope with. And we're going to be looking at other information or other groups as other just because of this limitation on our brain. So it's natural to, to realize that and to make sure that we're not making these artificial constructs, which are going to be detrimental to our life rather than useful. For instance, we're super fans of the paleo movement and we refuse to look at any other useful information that actually might help us get results or better results or something like that. Right. Just pick your tribe wisely, you know, <laughs> not based on some kind of trend or fad or whatever. I mean, really a tribe, if it's really a tribe, it should be a tribe for life. It should be tribe people that you're always going to care about. Otherwise, it's just another disposable modern relationship where you just uh, it might as well be something that a friend hookup. Right. And <laughs> you so know? you mentioned the things that you felt were more useful to have as a basis. It's close. It's like common values and close relationships. Could you go into a bit more depth about that? What kind of things are more appropriate for longer term tribes? You also emphasize the importance of loyalty in your book. So when guys are thinking about what's better for them for the longer term to become part of, what kind of uh, values or ideas do you think they should have in mind? You really have to connect with people who have a similar philosophy of life to you. I mean, because because there are a lot of game changers as, as far as dealing with other people. If you have a major, major religious disagreement with somebody, you can get along. I have plenty of people who I have major dis religious disagreements with, and we can have beers and have a good time. And I can get along with them on many different levels. But it really can't be part of this kind of close tribe. I think that uh, it's important for people who are in your tribe to be pretty much on the same page in terms of what they want out of life. Because you're ever in a situation where there's any kind of struggle, I think those kind of little hairline fractures get a lot bigger. And you have people competing for ideas. For me, they're definitely, uh, there's a phrase for it I can't find in my head right now. But, uh, you know, definitely uh, no-go zones as far as for people who I'm going to really spend a lot of time trying to get to know. There are definitely things that I'm like, oh, well, that person's nice, but, you know, and I think that uh, philosophy, religion, people who are really, really plugged into family lifestyles, I think that's very healthy. And I think that those people and single people live different rhythms. I think it's good to have both ideally, but a lot of times, you know, there'll be a conflict there and it just tends to people who don't have kids and people who have kids tend to drift apart for that reason. Ideally, in a real tribe, I think you'd have all those people. But I really think, yeah, it's philosophy. Philosophy and religion, I think, are the most important things uh, at the end of the day. And also, you also have to get along with people. That's just something we have that we click with people or we don't. You really enjoy their sense of humor or something about them that makes it fun to hang out with them. Because if you're going to hang out with somebody for a long time, you want to actually enjoy hanging out with them. And in terms of what we were talking about earlier, obviously, you want to surround yourself with people who are... Positive, not in the sense of being cheerleaders, but in the sense of people who aren't immersed in their own self-destruction. Because there are a lot of people who are that way. 
And you know, a lot of people who are already kind of like, well, I like a lot of things about you, but you're really just going to kind of bring me down constantly you know and it's sad when that happens but in your opinion is that a weakness coming to some of your values you talk about that support like strength you have these four values which make up masculinity strength courage uh, mastery and uh, honor when someone's being constantly in an energy we call them energy drain negative kind of defeatist is that being weak is that the opposite of masculinity in your mind um i don't think it's the opposite of masculine and i can take the example a really good friend of mine who's probably one of the most masculine guys I know. He's just got, kind of gotten mopey in his like 30s. He just doesn't seem, he seems to have like lost a lot of his willingness to push himself. Unfortunate, I don't really see it as a weakness. I just see it as kind of a consequence. And I think a lot of us know guys like that in modern life. They don't really see a place for themselves. And so they just kind of well, like, well, I guess I'm just going to drink. <laughs> and I think honestly, if the shit hit the fan, as they say tomorrow, I think he'd be on point. I think sometimes in those situations, it's like you don't have enough challenge in your life to make you care. In a way, it's a lack of the environment making use of his masculinity. But is that because he hasn't tried to put himself into new situations where he's going to be brought back alive and he's going to be making more use of of that again? Yeah, you do have to challenge yourself constantly in life to actually, uh, I think someone said the other day, uh, actually Master Chim, who has this really good podcast, masculinity is not not an end it's a path and uh, you don't get to just check off things on your list and then uh okay i'm masculine done right right i've got the skills i'm, I'm <laughs> yeah <there>. yeah i'm <laughs> good the beauty and tragedy of manliness is that you fight until you're the old lion and the other lions kill you and that's <laughs> that's kind of at odds with our modern idea of like you're supposed to live forever and be really really happy and and, and all that but right the happily ever after i get married i settle down yeah yeah live till you're 90 and play checkers for the last 30 years of your life whatever i do think it's important if you don't want to fall into that trap and i think that's probably a more important discussion is for guys who have friends that are kind of going that direction where they're a little bit flailing because like i said that is the crisis of masculinity is that we don't have enough challenge. We don't have enough things to do for the men who actually are masculine. And so they just kind of flounder and uh, just end up drinking or getting into trouble or whatever. And we can find ways to challenge those guys and involve them in life. So if some guys listening are recognizing these kind of behaviors, it's about finding a new source to channel your masculinity towards. And it's not thinking that I'm not a masculine guy. They have to like be aware that there's this dynamic in, in the environment and what they're doing in life. And without that, they can't be a real man or masculine guy. Challenges make masculinity. You have to have challenges to move up the scale. <laughs> so uh, there's a book out there. I haven't read it. It's a book called The The Obstacle is the Way. I love that book. Oh, I would, really? I is it strongly, good? I, I've listened to it like 40 times. I, I love audio books these days, but this book is excellent because it's not just because it's based on a lot of good stuff from stoicism. He's made it very readable and accessible. It's all of his old writings and just tons of great rules and a great mindset. So yeah, definitely read it, man. I mean, I highly enjoyed it and a lot of my buddies did too. Good. Yeah, maybe I'll have to check that out. Yeah, the title alone is kind of just what we're talking about. <laughs> One of the things we just touched on a little while back I wanted to come back to is evolutionary psychology. It seems like some of your stuff relates to evolutionary psychology, the, the view of life. Would you say it fits exactly with the kind of the views professed and popularized by some of the uh, researchers like David M. Buss and Jeffrey Miller. Is it very similar to that kind of stuff? Or do you see yourself as differing in the way you look at things? Um, very similar. I mean, everybody's going to differ in terms of what their prescription for society is. Again, that comes down to philosophy and what you want. I've talked to Jeffrey Miller. Uh, he actually liked The Way of Men, which was really flattering to me because he's a smart guy. I pulled a lot from evolutionary psychology in terms of sources for what I was writing because evolutionary psychology is interesting because it's kind of a mind game. If you really look at it, I mean, obviously they can do studies to a certain degree, but you know, a lot of it is figuring out, well, what would we really have done and how, why would we have been this way? It's like kind of a problem solving thing. And that's kind of what I did with the way of men. And it's like, well, why would men want these things from each other? And that's how I came to kind of the tactical virtues that I talk about in my book in terms of like, well, to survive, you need this, this, and this. And for most of our history, that's what we needed from each other. And so that's kind of still how we judge each other today as to who's manly and who's not manly. We're still kind of hardwired to try and prove that stuff to each other. It just it makes a lot of sense. And one of the things that Jeffrey said in an interview I did with him recently was uh, that evolutionary psychology is focused a lot on how women select men, but 
hasn't focused much at all on how men select each other. And if you really think about how men select each other, again, like picking the sports team kind of thing, if you're in a survival situation and you don't get picked from the team, you're probably going to die. Yeah, that's true. It's really interesting. And of course, your book's focused on why men select other men. And I guess what is established in evolutionary psychology is that women tend to pick men who are picked by other men. It's an indirect route. They haven't studied the exact men-to-men relationship, but they've studied the indirect relationship. Exactly. Great. So one thing Jeffrey does, his book focuses on the arts and creativity, this aspect, and calling these aspects of why we develop these. There's no real survival or replication value behind the fact that there's a lot of guys who are musicians and, and arts and they get a lot of success with women and so on. So, you know, his whole theory is the runaway theory of sexual selection, where we develop these things because they're like signs in the environment, they're costly signs. What is your view on that? Because I wasn't sure when I read through your book if you saw the arts in these areas as something useful or, or not useful or an aspect of masculinity or not. Well, you know, I was on a hike with a friend the other day and uh, he asked me if whether or not I thought singing was masculine. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, that's one of the reasons why I developed this kind of system is because I wanted to be able to answer that question. Everybody wants yeah. to know, is this masculine or is this masculine? Is this just cultural? Is this not cultural? You know, And so you know, I feel like if you actually <laughs> use the things that I've talked about in my book, you can actually kind of make that judgment. If you look at the ultimate end of something, the same thing. The ultimate end of singing, it just depends what you're singing about. Uh-huh. If you look at the ultimate end of singing, you know, if you're the Justin Bieber, okay. you know, <laughs> if you're singing about uh, frivolous things, if you look at what men sung about for 90% of history, it was war. If you look at all the old epics and all the old poetry, it's like that was what men did. Women were not writing epics and they were not writing poetry and they were to, that was men recounting the story of men. And obviously that has some kind of value to tribe. Your oral history is your history. So a lot of, I mean, poetry and things came out of this. Uh, you know, men retelling their story over and over again. It's like that, uh, everybody's seen the movie 300, the guy who is sent back specifically not to die just so that he could tell the story. I mean, that's a valuable thing. And I think in the modern world, it's kind of silly. We make the arts and so forth about uh, femininity in some way, because I think a lot of the modern arts do tend to be about uh, creating pretty things for women to look at. That's been true for a long time. If you look at even uh, classical music and theater, let's get all the rich people together in a room and someone plays a violin. It gives them something to do. But uh, if you look at a lot of the epics and a lot of the stories that have been passed down, it's really been an area that's always been pioneered by men. Yeah. Have you got any modern day examples? I don't know if like you look at Mick Jagger or you look at some of these guys who've had a lot of success with women, for example, or have been crazy famous uh, rock stars or so on. And I guess guys appreciate more. Like the Rolling Stones guys are going to appreciate more. Would you see those as good examples of a masculine version of, of arts and, and creation versus it sounds like what you're going against is the pop, the, the commercial, which is the extreme opposite of what you'd be looking for. The Rolling Stones would be a, a good split because they actually sang about other things aside from things that would make girls coo, which is like, I would say, you know, your modern boy band kind of singing is the kind of uh, telling girls that she, they're pretty so that they, they scream, which is one kind of singing. But look at like metal. <laughs> you know, if you look at something like, it's, it's always funny, but I, I like any man who can enjoy Man O' War unironically. Any of those uh, big bands that sing around uh, about masculinity or like Viking metal or all those things. There's a bunch of guys doing stuff like that that are basically almost giving us this comic book idea of masculinity. But uh, at the same time, men have always done that. They enjoy that. They, you know, just take it up over the top a little bit and we get a kick out of it, I think. Uh, so I mean, think that those are kind of our, in many ways, our modern guys carrying on that tradition of singing songs about manly deeds. Great, great. It sounds like most are, although it can be useful to attract women, like that's the argument of Jeffrey Miller, isn't something you would really put within the area of masculinity in terms of, of an attribute, it's something that's developed more for a replication. Your, yours is more based on survival, your views of masculinity versus replication. Right. I would agree that probably a lot of music has been made to please women. Like, obviously, we have the boy bands. Uh, and people have had boy bands and stuff like that for a long time. This form, but there have been a lot of, like, I'm going to sing a song for the pretty girls. That's been around for a very long time. And I think that he'd be absolutely right to say that that is uh, one of the reasons that has probably pushed musical development and, uh, and so forth over the years. I mean, I think those ideas go in harmony. 
early on, I think a lot of that probably was developed for men singing around each other. Uh, but uh, absolutely things that could impress women. have uh, Men always trying to impress women. That's just a, something we do. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, great, great. What ideas circulate currently that you believe undermine men's masculinity? What are the top things, the mainstream things that you feel are not healthy? You pointed out a few things like the news and some other things earlier on in the interview, but which ones would you say are like the top three? The top three? Well, uh, in the book, I talk about the Bonobo Masturbation Society. Okay, and- so what, what is that? <laughs> what is that? Uh, they, it's the idea that it, I got it from a book on evolutionary psychology that talked about the bonobos versus chimps. Basically, the idea that bonobos that lived in peace and harmony and all they do all the time is have sex and they don't know their fathers and they are nonviolent because they don't hunt. They don't hunt a lot. They do a little bit. And the men are kind of kept down by the women, whereas chimps are very patriarchal. The women just follow along with the men. The men stick together because they are in a more competitive environment. There's not a lot of homosexual sex. There's not a lot of sex for pleasure. There's mating and there's a lot ever. And I think in a modern world, we have one of the biggest problems, like I said, is, is the idea of defining your masculinity by sex. I think that that becomes destructive very quickly. And I think that a lot of uh, guys realize that it's like, okay, Tinder is fun for a little while. I've talked to a bunch of guys at the gym about this cool for a few weeks while you're playing that game. And then all of a sudden you're like, uh, okay, this is getting kind of gross. <laughs> it just becomes this kind of weird, dark place. It takes men to a, where they're only, uh, where all they're thinking about is chasing sex. Uh, because it can become very self-defeating. Yeah. Very distract. It comes with like a distraction in your life rather than something that's yeah, it becomes like a weird addiction. You get addicted to the attention. I mean, if you're good at it, especially, I think it becomes non-productive. And again, I think when you're doing that, then it becomes a, a thing where you're almost taking a feminine. It's like if everything you do, if the reason why you go to the gym and the reason why you do everything is to get more women. I wrote an essay a few uh, years ago called Everyone a Harlot. It's basically like we're all whores. <laughs> you know, it's like that's kind of what modern society wants us to be. Like everybody's concerned whether they're hot or not. And, uh, you know, men didn't really do that until very recently. And I'm sure uh, there's always been a small percentage of everything. But uh, the mainstream of men didn't sit around worrying about uh, women we're going to like all the time. And I think that that becomes a big distraction for masculinity. So I would say that's one of the big ones. Another one would just be the constant messaging that masculinity is bad. And I think I would advise people to ask why they want you to think that. Who gains by asking you and telling you that masculinity is bad and that you need to be more like women? What do they have to gain by you being more submissive? I think that that's an important thing that I don't think a lot of men are thinking about. I would also say, like I said, it's constant gossip and squawking in modern society. This kind of moral, these kind of Twitter pillories where we hang people out to dry for these fake moral things that we don't even believe. Right. And then it changes every single week who's who's being... Exactly. You know. We're just going to lynch somebody and ruin their lives because people need something to talk about and because it drives clicks. And I think participating in that is kind of gross. Well, it's kind of bastardizing the system you prefer is where there has to be another just because of our limitations. And it's using that against, well, just to distract people and to make money. And- well, it's like village shaming on a grand scale. You know, <laughs> it's like a moral shaming on a grand scale. It's Because it's not a group creating another. It's just like everybody, all these disconnected people ganging up on somebody because it's fun and that they get attention for doing it. I'd much rather see this tribe <laughs> fighting that tribe than uh, just weird fake moral posturing. Great, great. In your book, you talk about what actually makes up, you know, it's your system, your framework uh, to define, like you were saying earlier, which you can kind of figure out everything, if it's masculine or not, with with the way you've described it in the book. Which are these four factors, strength, courage, mastery, and honor? Could you just give like a quick overview of how those fit together and why you see those as the key things? As I said, it has to do with how men select each other. And that's when I came through the theory of masculinity, I was going through all these different things, trying to figure out which things are cultural and which things are kind of the same in every society. You can go around the world and say, aside from, you know, you have like a little cluster of monks or something, but they're not really in the mainstream. But if you go around the world, men are supposed to be strong. That's a pretty normal thing, I think, in most cultures throughout history. Right. Very easily acceptable. Yeah. yeah. Men, are, men are supposed to be courageous. That's true always and everywhere. Men appreciate competence. The difference between, I got a, I was in a boxing class the other day and a girl was in the class and she was giggling every time she screwed up. 
men hate that because we want to be seen as competent all the time. And you know, might apologize like, oh, I'm going to do this better. I'm going to do this better. Oh, sorry about that. I, we'll all do that. But if you get a girl in the class, she'll like giggle like, oh my God, I can't believe I suck. Men hate doing that. And I think that mastery is really about competence. And because we want to prove to each other that we would be a good member of the group. We're not, we are members to be reckoned with. Right. We can be respected. And you're talking about this earlier. Guys can respect you because you're contributing something. Yeah. Yeah. You're not just giggling and saying like, oh my God, I'm useless. Take care of me. Honor is very moralized in, in Western history. It has a very long and confusing history. And it's gotten to the point that we've, when people talk about honor, they really, you're just talking about something that makes them feel good morally. Uh, which is really not what I'm talking about. I think I'm talking about kind of older definitions of honor that have to do with loyalty. And ultimately, what I mean by that is honor is really a man's sense of his own reputation as a man within his group. If you don't care about your reputation within a group, you are not a valuable member of that group. If you don't care what all the men in your group think about you, you're a wild card. Or you're a potential traitor, you're a potential problem. Uh, or you're a potential just deserter. When things get rough, you're going to bail. If you look at how men react in platoons and stuff like that, you hear these stories over and over again that men in stressful situations will end up fighting just for the guys next to them because they don't want to disappoint. They don't want to let those guys down. That's my finest definition of honor is that uh, you care enough for what the, the guy next to you thinks to do your best. I think that's a great point to make because it conflicts with, there's some movements out there which are kind of saying, you know, you should be fearless and you should not care about what anyone else thinks. It's kind of the individual and it's like the self-development. Also in some of the pickup artist areas, you, you hear this a lot. I think you've got a very, very solid argument there as to why that's not the case. Our reputation is dependent on not being a wild card, not being someone who doesn't care about what everyone else thinks. As with almost every question, I find, and this is the same thing when we were talking about the difference between uh, mating and selection for men, you know, with so many questions, the answer is not either or, but both. I understand the, the viewpoint of you can't care about what everybody thinks because you can't. And for the same reason we talked about earlier, I mean, you can't care about what 7 billion people think. You have to filter it out to actually get anything done in life. I mean, I go and read YouTube comments about me that are fucking awful. And like, you know, like, you know, you want to get mad and be like, fuck you. And, you know, you want to go after these people, but you have to realize that you can't care about every stranger's opinion. And so I think that the solution to that is actually to choose whose opinion you care about. Your tribe is really the people who you actually care about what they say. It's like pick those people who you admire. I don't necessarily value the criticism of every stranger in the world. I value the criticism of these guys I respect. Excellent. Yeah, that's a great point to bring that out. Since you were also brought up, you know, mastery, I was just wondering if you read Robert Greene's Mastery and what you thought of that as related to your work. Um, no, I haven't. I mean, it's the same word. I mean, I came, I formulated my own definition based on kind of my evolutionary theory, not necessarily. His is more like how to go about it, rather than you're talking more about its importance and its role and, and so on. Yep, yep. One of the things that you touch on is testosterone in your book. And one of the things I believe in is there's a big biological factor behind how would you say some of the guy's anxiety, lack of confidence, some of the less masculine attributes we have in modern society today. So I was just wondering what your view is on that. If there's a biological aspect to modern day society, which is uh, helping to undermine masculinity today? Well, there's two things. I mean, uh, when you talk about testosterone and hormones and the things that make us different from women, I think that people ignore the argument many times when they talk about, we're not just talking about on any given day, we're talking about over a lifetime. So I think that having these chemicals in our body for a long period of time, it's not, you don't just get to take them when you're 25 and then decide that, oh, I'm the same as all men now. I definitely disagree with that. I think that it's about having those chemicals as a boy, as a young man and so forth. They influence us for a long, long, long period of time. Maybe in a way that like, uh, this is making testosterone seem like a bad thing, which I think it's a really good thing. But uh, in a way that a drug, as your levels start to go down, you're going to wish you had more of it and kind of be depressed that you don't. <laughs> uh, and I think that that's happened to a lot of guys. I mean, and there's so many causes for possible lowering testosterone, whether they're environmental causes or they say that your, your testosterone drops when your team loses. It's like if your whole lifestyle is submission, if all you get to do is say, yes, sir, uh, yes, ma'am, how can I help you? If that's what you do every day and that's all you can do, and then you go home and you say, you know, a woman who bosses you around and all that. I mean, you have so many guys like that, and that's got to be murder on their testosterone. 
Because testosterone, if it rises when you're winning, it definitely probably goes down when you're losing. Right. And that's like a vicious circle dynamic you're looking at right there. Because if it goes lower, then you can be less competitive and less confident and so on. Exactly, exactly. So as you said, they're in a like, kind of downward spiral of, of anti-masculinity and submission. Great. So I want to touch on a few things. Thank you for your time. I appreciate this. What is the strongest character attribute you think you have or that you recognize in yourself for good or, or for bad or maybe a bit of both? Hmm. Hard question. <laughs> well, hard question. I mean, I guess I would say good or bad. I mean, uh, from someone who preaches tribalism, I'm a very Nietzschean personality in the sense that I'm always kind of self-overcoming, which is good. But uh, obviously, if you're constantly evolving as a person, sometimes you change the whole way to another place. <laughs> and so it kind of makes it hard to be in this kind of tribal stability in the same kind of mindset all the time. So I personally, I mean, I think that's, something really cool that I bring to the table, but then also sometimes that can be a, if you are that kind of person, I think if you want to be part of a tribe, you have to choose at some point. You have to choose, you have to say, these guys are good enough. This tribe is good enough for me, rather than when it's very tempting to just be constantly like, oh, I'm on to the next thing. Oh, you know, like, you know, in life and, and uh, it kind of makes you a disloyal person. So I definitely am aware of that myself and try to keep the ties that I make. Try not to let my searching through uh, ideas and mental evolution uh, undermine my personal relationships. Great point. Thanks for that. So I know you've written a bit about the different movements like the manosphere, feminist movements, and so on, kind of all around this masculinity topic. Could you give us a rough overview of where you see things like in the different different aspects of it? Because I know it's, it's quite a complicated mess of different movements at the moment. And I was just wondering if you had a, like a simple way that you look at it. Well, feminism is just, I mean, that's an ongoing thing. I've studied that back pretty far. And in many ways, that's stuck in a repeating cycle. And, you know, without being too misogynist, I want to say that it's it's perfect distillation of female philosophy in the, in the sense of it. It is whatever it wants to be whenever it wants to be it. It's a very changeable thing. It's basically whatever women want is feminism when they want it. And then it's not feminism when they don't want it. So I don't try and pay attention to that. I, I pay attention to its effect on men. As Putin said, it's not the best to argue with women. I'd like to focus on what men are doing. So I focus in more on, say, like the manosphere or something like that. I haven't followed a lot of blogs like that uh, recently. Uh, I am in contact with a lot of those guys and have been uh, for a long time. The manosphere, I think, was just something that uh, occurred at this moment where a lot of guys realized that you know, what they were being told in school to be good little boys and then women will love you wasn't necessarily true. That uh, it wasn't exactly how things work and what they were being told that women want is just kind of what women say, not necessarily what they actually want. And I think that that was very useful. And then, But I think that in many ways it's evolved. It's something that people are going to evolve through, maybe constantly. Maybe there'll constantly be new blogs that maybe won't be called the Manosphere, but there'll be constantly be new blogs of men discovering these things and wanting to talk about them with other men. But then, you know, at a certain point, okay, if once you realize all this stuff, you're kind of going over the same information over and over and over again. And so I think you see a lot of those guys looking for the next level of meaning from that. So I think a lot of those guys have gone off into like Orini. I can never pronounce his name. I've been talking to him for years. But uh, Davis J. Orini, I think he, he's one of these guys who's kind of gone off into more uh, neo-reactionary ideas in the sense that he's, uh, okay, what society would be better? Okay, our society's messed up. What society would be better? And so I think a lot of those guys are involved in that debate. And, uh, so they kind of move through the manosphere and go into like talking about other ideas uh, that are more about the future and, and what must be done. And I've done a lot about that too. I mean, when I, uh, I write for some groups that are fairly tribal in their thinking as to what kind of future they would want. Great, great. Thanks for that overview because it's a bit of a complex thing to navigate. In terms of getting really practical and some takeaways for the guys, what would be your top three recommendations that if they want to become more masculine, what kind of practical things could they do over the next couple of months to become bring more of this into their life and, and put themselves on the path to becoming more masculine in their life? What kind of practical things could they go out and do? Let's start with the one we both agreed on. Uh, the, the obstacle is the way. Uh, <laughs> I think that that's a good uh, piece of advice in the sense of, you know, you have to uh, break through your comfort zone. Uh, masculinity is about becoming more confident from facing challenges. So if you have no challenges, you have no really no confidence. So you have to go out and challenge yourself. And maybe, you, especially if maybe guys who are thinking maybe they don't, they aren't the most masculine. Because a lot of guys, I think, especially I think smarter guys who are, spend a lot more time reading and they're online, they kind of see 
masculinity as being this jock thing uh, that they don't really feel connected to. And I, in my early 30s, I went out and uh, re-looked at a lot of this stuff that I thought I didn't like. And uh, that's kind of when I started my path to writing about the, the way of men and so forth is really re-examining all these things that I thought that I, that I thought were really dumb and for stupid jocks and stuff like that when I was a kid. Look at that stuff with a fresh pair of eyes. And uh, look at a lot of uh, ideas about war, ideas about heroism and things like that, and uh, explore that and uh, look at masculinity from the fresh set of eyes. And uh, the second would be, uh, and I always say this when I'm asked this question, is that you need to go out and find men who you have a connection with, whether it be some kind of martial arts, whether it be some kind of fitness thing. Any place, and it's so hard to do, uh, but if you can find an environment that is mostly male, you're going to absorb male culture from other men. You're going to build relationships with men that are kind of healthy masculine relationships. That's the place to start. Anywhere where you can be surrounded by mostly men who are kind of interested in doing manly things. That is going to require the first one, which is pushing yourself outside of your comfort zone. That's the, the biggest thing. And uh, for those people, I guess, who are maybe came from the manosphere or, or whatever, I think that maybe the third piece is to stop focusing so much on what women think. Right, right. So I wanted to connect those two last points, which is basically around the pickup artist community, because I think one of the things you know, the pickup artist community has been around like 15, 16 years. And I think one of the things when I got into it, when it was 2000 or something, it was interesting from a male bonding perspective, because I made some very good friends within that because we were doing something. And I think at the time, we didn't have something else <laughs> to be doing together. Uh, for want of a better word, and, and it was part of the attraction of the whole thing. And people have commented on this before, and uh, it's probably still going on a lot today, that the guys who get involved in that movement are probably there more so for looking to relate to other guys, and they don't have something like martial arts or something else like that where they can find this. And then you have the conflict where, of course, it's all focused about women, and obviously there's, that becomes very detrimental in, in itself when the only goal is to go and meet women and, and, and so on. So... What, what is your take on a pickup artist community in general? Is it something to stay away from in terms of meeting up and, you know, kind of going out in these groups? Because it's not a subject we've talked about before. Well, you brought up an interesting point there. I mean, uh, uh, male bonding, the phrase, uh, you know, comes from Lionel Tiger. And he was, you know, basically an evolutionary psychologist. And, and, uh, and his definition of it, you know, was men tend to bond over some kind of, you know, aggression whether it's whether hunting or actual aggression against other men or what. And, you know, what are you doing when you're going out with a bunch of guys trying to pick up girls? Well, you're a hunting party. You know, I mean, you're doing that thing. I could see how that would be a huge attraction. I mean, and it is. It's like this, uh, we're going to go out and then it becomes what we're going to talk about. I mean, I've been out with guys who are doing that. And, they, you know, it's like it becomes this game. It's like, OK, OK, I'm going to go over here. You're going over there. And it's, it's a hunting party. So, I mean, maybe that would be a good thing for some of the guys. As we said, I think just, I, I don't think that uh, getting involved with something like that is necessarily detrimental. And I think that that community has helped a lot of guys get over some issues that they had where maybe just women just boss them around, <laughs> you know, like or they just didn't know how to deal with women at all. And, you know, they're men, so they still, they need women for something. So, uh, you know, I mean, I think that that's a part of life to just to help them get past some of those anxieties. I think that that could be a good thing. Like I said, if it becomes your whole life becomes about uh, getting laid, then I think that that's sad, and I, and, I, and ultimately it's dissolute. And I, I think a lot of masculine writers over the history would have frowned on that. Right, right. I've personally seen a lot of guys lose their souls a bit through this process and become. I don't know if it's demasculinized, but it's definitely yeah kind of a loss of purpose in their life, and it's less satisfaction over time rather than getting better. Jack, thank you so much for this interview today. It's been a very interesting discussion and I definitely recommend your book to all the guys because it's a very interesting read. It's very original and it's got lots of uh, great ideas as we've seen today. So thanks for your time and I hope to connect with you now on time. Thanks for having me. Take control of your dating life today. Take one idea or one insight from today's episode and apply it today. Don't wait, do it today. That's all it takes to change your life step-by-step, episode-by-episode. Learn more about what I, Angel Donovan, and my team do at DatingSkillsReview.com. How we help men like you take control of their dating lives.